Yeah, it really feels like like that is that's real journalism, right? Because you, you know he's not waiting, having to wait for a press release. He gets to actually wait, so, go and talk to all of the writers. So is he one of the media relations people over? over yeah. JPL? So he so so Ian got a job at media relations at NASA JPL, and so now yes, he I'll is. Have. Okay. Yeah, so he's he's helping. I forget exactly which part of the team. There's some good he's people in. I've worked with over at JPL. Yeah, like, yeah, used with, yeah. I guess. Yeah, they're. The I mean, relations. they're all great. I mean, I still think, you know, at some point NASA is going to realize that it doesn't actually need us as the media because they do such a good job. I know, I know. Don't tell them. <laughs> don't right? tell them. Right, they're the ones with the telescopes. They're the ones with they the with the missions. They already cornered the market on yeah. space. Yeah, news. they've Come got on. gigantic reach on pretty much every platform um don't tell them yeah yeah exactly don't tell them yeah yeah and that way we still have a job we still have a purpose i mean uh, i read about earth science too so i'm fine i'm gonna say hi to some people uh how good is the uh national I'm trying to think what you call it the uh usgs it? the usgs yeah they, they're not as good as nasa right I mean, they're awesome people and yeah. awesome scientists doing great work all over the place. I love them. But their media, yeah. their media work isn't quite as as comprehensive. Um, it depends on which branch. I will say it's very complicated with USGS because they do so many different types of things yeah. with geology and stuff. Their volcano people are just fantastic, and I've loved working with them in the past month. Um, some of their other branches are more just like quietly doing really good science. <laughs> all right, I should say hi to some people. I'm going to say hi to Andy Kelly, Astro B, Bob Moeller, Bobby Polit. Uh, Borat Klenkar, Brian Yuku, Dave Lane, David Fairweather, Gordon Dewis, Horizon Brave, Ian Farkron, Johnny J, Johnny Z, Martin Bradshaw, Nancy Graziano, Nicholas B, Paranor, Patricia Kai, Raj Luthra, Rich Wilson, Celia Myers, Scott Bragdon, Simply 1V, Tesla Ranger, everybody on Twitch. I apologize, I don't see your names right now, but hello. Um... And of course, this is this is the special bonus episode that you get with me because I should be in Japan right now, but I'm not. <laughs> Are you one of the unfortunate people whose travel plans got yes. nixed? Ah, I, I heard you say yeah, on the astronomy too. cast that you scrub your plans. Yeah, 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 and you know, and everyone's like, "Well, you should go here," and like, "No, I'm not going anywhere." No. no. Yeah, all of our our travel to uh, European geosciences and to. Japan geosciences are all sort of very TV -D. yeah yeah and you can see conferences like there's this one I'm watching LPSC to see what they decide yeah there's this science go. communications conference that that I was mm. I wanted to go to um in Oregon and even that I'm now going oh you know what it's just not Oregon. the time it's not time to just be around other human beings in any shape or form Introverts time. paradise. It's time to go. Yeah, exactly. Wanna, it's time I don't want to say there's that, any silver lining that to this. That solitude all, that we've that I've been training for all my life. I would be more worried that the the border entries may change while I'm out of the country. Like, yeah, I might not be able to ah. come back for a oh. period of time. <laughs> we were just having a conversation. A couple of us are going to Canada. We're hoping to get back. Yes. Yeah, we've only got yeah. 20 cases of coronavirus here in Canada so far. But we okay. we have tested apparently more in British Columbia than all of the United States. That does not surprise me. <laughs> so, yeah, we're not doing so great at the testing yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to go to uh, headquarters, um, ESA headquarters in Netherlands, and it would get consult as well. So I'm also very sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's happening everywhere. I think right now. Yeah, it really like it really sucks, and I don't think that we're really going to ex understand the true consequences of just what this means in terms of travel, in terms of just global supply chains, in terms of yeah, this is. I mean, this is you know, it's not panic, and it's definitely don't be completely unconcerned. It's it's somewhere in between, and. And that's what we need to sort out. And I think, and I hope that this at least teaches us all to wash our hands and not touch our faces. Yeah, that's <laughs> if there if if there is a silver lining, yeah. it's that we will we are all refreshing our memories on how to wash our hands yeah. properly. Yeah, yeah. 
probably. Yeah. Um, and of course, uh, you know, people are all wondering, you know, like, why is all the soap being sold now? Like, weren't people washing their hands before? Yeah, What's yeah, that yeah. about? Like... company, the soap is gone. <laughs> yeah. So they just basically don't have any soap. Like, what were you comp- doing before? Yeah, what were you all doing before? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't think I want to ever know that yeah. answer. But also, like, touching your, like, have you actually, like, seen how often you actually touch your face? It's hopeless. Completely I've started hopeless. like I've, I've started carrying this rock around so that I have something to do with my hands except touch my. Hands. I know the, the the more people talk about it, the more you want to touch your face. Yeah, it's kind of idi- like this. idiosomatic. Or yeah, something. totally. Don't don't think about <laughs> the elephant. All right, yeah. let's uh, let's begin. Put you all back in your corners here. I'll bring up my intro. Yeah. All right, and here we go. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, March 4th, 2020. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about Earth's tiny new moon, temporary moon, uh, merging white dwarfs, uh, uh, finally a bright comet, although I say this every year, um, a cool 3D printed uh, pair of binoculars, and uh, bed rest studies for spaceflight, and all... Another setback for Starship. So joining me this week on my screen, I've got Dave Dickinson. David. Hey there. Still here in Norfolk. Yeah. Done. My book's on autopilot now, so I can write. I can think about other things. Yeah, I got you the intro. We figured out yes. the cover. Yes. It's time to just rest, <laughs> relax. This is that part where I have to think about something else, so I don't think, what did we miss? Right. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure it'll turn up later, and it'll, it'll end up it in will. the addenda. Yeah, so, second edition. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Kimberly. Hello, Fraser. Happy podcast day. Happy podcast day to you, my favorite too. day of the week. <laughs> and we've got uh, Veronica. Hello, space enthusiast. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good night. As, as good, good night. Every, as, every yeah. time of the day, yeah. whenever you, yeah. wherever you are. <laughs> yeah. As always, we, uh, we admire your professionalism and dedication to uh, getting up at what has got to be four in the morning. I don't even know what time it is there. So yeah. again, thank you. We appreciate uh, everything I, you I do. I appreciate as well. But my r- red eyes, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> we can't see it. Um, all right. So uh, before we get into the special guest, one, uh, this is your special bonus episode with me. Now that I've got my canceled plans to Tokyo uh, in an alternate universe, I would be in Tokyo right now on vacation with my son. But instead, um, my loss is your gain. So uh, so I'm here to help with, the, uh, with this week's episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. And we couldn't do this without the generous support of all of our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They are, they are the producers. They are the... Man, the organizers, they coordinate, they communicate, they help moderate all the stuff that's going on. And if you are into space and you want to be part of this amazing community, go to wshcrew.space. They will give you a way to log in, get information. You can join the chat that happens down in the bottom of the show while we talk. But also, really, you become the executive producer of this show. You can help to choose the guests that show up. Because I don't. So... I just show up and am surprised at whoever is the guest this week. And speaking of surprise guests this week, we've got three people, uh, which you're going to have to all introduce yourselves. Welcome to the the uh, Weekly Space Hangout. Well, hello. I'm Joel Kastner, professor at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology with the Imaging Science and Astrophysics programs. And I'm joined by two graduate students, two PhD students from our uh, astrophysics program. I'm Annie Dixon Vanderveld. I uh, work with Joel studying young stars, and it's my fourth year of my PhD. And I'm Emily Wilson. I'm also a PhD student. I'm in my third year, and I'm tagging along with Joel right now (laughs) for this project. Awesome. And I'm sure we're going to get into just your work in general, but but you're here for a specific story to talk about. So uh, who wants to who wants to begin? Well, should I start? You start. Yeah, you start. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to, to Annie and, and Emily in a, in a second. But the the bottom line is, Fraser, that um, we have discovered we being Annie and Emily um, a very unusual 
very faint object um, that we originally thought was the nearest, sorry, the youngest known substellar object within about 300 light years of the sun. All right, so let's break that down. So uh, right. youngest substellar object, so that is a planet? Is that like an astronomer term for a planet? Well. It's a planet or a brown dwarf. Um, do we know what a brown dwarf is? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so basically it's hard to really observationally tell the difference, the cusp between when something is a brown dwarf, as in it formed like a star, or when something is a giant gas planet and it formed like a planet. So we just need substellar to put both of those together. Right. And I guess part of what makes this really interesting, you mentioned that it is very, very young. So how old are you thinking that this object is? Well, it's anywhere between three to five million years old. For a frame of reference, our sun is five billion years old. So it's relatively young as far as stars go. Right. I, I tried to kind of um, figure this out recently. It's kind of like having a, a month old baby next to me, a middle aged guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so talk about your, your technique for how you actually discovered it. It's a funny story because you want this like eureka moment that we discovered it really in an exciting way. Um, but we've been studying this group of stars called Epsilon Cha. And we had this big list of stars and we said, you know, wouldn't it be fun if we could add a couple more to this list? So we were looking for other stars that had similar motions in the sky just through a database. And, you know, I'm scrolling. I found one. And it was, oh, here's one. Add it to your list. I, I did that five times and turned out that one of those, after a bunch of science that Annie did, turns out one of those was this substellar object. Um, now, you actually pulled some of these observations from the Gaia satellite, right? Yeah. So, oh. I mean, you know, we've talked about Gaia kind of ad nauseum here on the Weekly Space Hand. We're gigantic fans of the Gaia, um, which, you know, is mainly known for its astrometry, but is also a perfectly capable planet hunter in its own right. So how did you use Gaia to find this object? So like Emily was saying, we looked at the parallaxes and proper motions, which is just distance and movement of the stars that we knew were members of this group to find stars with similar distances and movements in the sky. And when we found it, we then used the Gaia photometry. So Gaia also looks at the uh, colors of these objects to analyze its age and its uh, position. So that's how we found out that it was substellar because it, because it is very dim and very red compared to the rest of the objects. Right. Um, I would love to know, like, you know, we're so familiar. You talked about, the, you know, our own sun. You know, here we are four and a half billion years after the formation of the sun, and yet there was a time when our solar system was that kind of an age. So does what does looking at these sorts of objects tell us about the early history of our own solar system? Well, so first, I think before I answer that really good question, I should say that there's a there's an alternate uh, hypothesis, alternative hypothesis for what this object could be that we're starting to to work on right now. Come on, uh, alien megastructure. No. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's something. That <laughs> giant mirror. Uh, that's one possibility. Right, okay. Um, of course. I, I'm only being partly facetious. When we started to look at it more carefully, um, thanks to some friends of ours um, at American Museum of Natural History and University of Montreal and Arizona State, um, Jackie Parody and, and Jonathan Gagne and Adam Schneider, um, they got a spectrum for us. And now this, we're thinking that we might be seeing a, a young star entirely in scattered light. So <laughs> if, if that's the case, and in fact, it looks like it might be a young twin to the parent star that we originally thought this, this substellar object was orbiting, if you're following me. So what do you mean by scattered light then? So what we, what we think we might be seeing is a disc. I guess this is a, a, a video cast, so I can like right. use my. Yeah, 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 yeah. People can see your your uh, your 
uh, charades uh, description <laughs> yeah, of what we're seeing here. Two words. So, um, <laughs> so we, we, we think we may be seeing a star that's embedded inside a disk and we're seeing that disk almost edge on and that that disk may be feeding this baby star more matter as we speak. Um, so those are sort of the two different um, hypotheses that we have right now. And you're catching us at a time where we have to get more data in order right. to figure out which one is, is right. Right, but I know that like one of the things that that guy is all about is is watching the motion of of stars, especially being able to see the kinds of of planets that are difficult for almost any other method. You could see them face on and watch as the star traces a little circle in the sky. You're not using that technique at all. You're you're saying that you're actually seeing this star seen edge on. Right. Yeah. The the um, if I understand what you're what you're asking, then. then this this uh, thing that we thought might be a substellar yeah. object. Sure, brown dwarf, planet, yeah. disk, okay. yep. star yeah. feeding another star, who knows? It's, Alien it's megastructure. So away, it's so far away from its parent star that it would take um, hundreds of thousands of years to do one orbit. So we're not going to see it orbiting. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, you say you want to do follow-up observations, so how would you like to be able to do that, and what are some of the real key insights that you're hoping to uncover? One of you, one of you want to take that one on? Or? Um, one of the main ways we want to look at it is the spectrum that we have right now is for the infrared, which is uh, the red and the, the dusty part, but we want to also look at it in the optical to see Young stars are classified by their spectral type based on how they look in the range of optical light. And in order to confirm if it is a star or a substellar object, looking in the optical is probably the best way to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And then the other, we, want, we also want to look more in the infrared to see if we can get an image. If it's a disk, you'll see the, like, the point source of the star, and then you should see this like thick dust lane going down the middle of it. So those are the two ways we're trying to approach to answer right. what it is. I mean, there's been some oh, abs. Oh, go ahead, David. Uh, I'm just wondering how faint are these in optical light, magnitude-wise? The uh, companion object is 19.9 <laughs> magnitudes. Right. That's yeah, very faint. Very the, faint. The, yeah, the host star is like 10 magnitudes. No, 15 magnitudes because mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. 5 magnitudes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, have you seen some of those incredible images from the National Radio Observatory of these planetary disks? And you can actually see like, you know, this record shape around. And they've got hundreds of them of them now. Yeah. So I guess that's one way. And then, of course, I, I can think of a very powerful uh, visual telescope that uh, you might be able to get some time on out in space. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, uh, funny you should mention that the deadline is Friday. For yeah. <laughs> So we, we, we tossed that idea around for a little while and decided we'll do a little more um, uh, background work and then we'll, we'll go there probably. I should mention, by the way, that the sort of, of work you're talking about, um, imaging disks at radio wavelengths, both to, both to see the dust, um, that's that's uh, the cold dust around them, and to see the, the molecules that are orbiting the star. That's something Annie's been working on, actually. Kind of ironic now that we may have discovered another object that she has to go and start to <laughs> really, you know, dig, dig deeper on. Yeah. So my last question then is, do you think this is the kind, is this a scenario? Is this the kind of thing that you're going to see a lot more of into the future? Is this a very common situation, do you think? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I will tell you that this, this object, if we're right about it being an edge on disc, it's only the second one um, that's, that's this close, you know, within a few hundred light years like this of the sun. Um, so that that makes it a very unusual object. There are four examples I can think of of these low mass stars that are pairs, sitting in pairs, where at least one of them has a disk and they're this young. So it's a pretty it's a pretty rare kind of kind of thing. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. There are only so many young stars nearby, anyway. So it's a pretty low population of stars to look at. Yeah, fantastic. Well, uh, so if people want to follow your work, where should they go? Well, probably the best place to go, if we can maintain it uh, properly, is, is our, our websites here at, at Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, we have a website that's devoted to um, the Laboratory for Multi-Wavelength Astrophysics, which is sort of a, 
um, an umbrella um, laboratory that we all work in so that you can go to the, to the LAMA website um, at RIT. And I'm trying to think other things while well, you can- you Annie can, and I yeah. are both on Twitter also Perfect. and happy to answer questions and we'll be tweeting about this Great. as it well. All right, I'm we'll put links fun. to that in our, in our show notes as well. So and now you got some incentive to update your website. <laughs> for the weekly space hangout uh, bump that's about to show up. Well, uh, uh, Emily, Annie, and, and Joel, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. We really appreciate it. And good luck with your research and getting that Hubble time. Thank, thank you so you. much. <laughs> Our pleasure. All right. See you later. Thank you. All right, so uh, we're going to move on to uh, some of the rest of the news for this week. Uh, but before we do, um, Kimberly, let's, uh, let's pick a name. Okay, so the names we are talking about are for the uh, NASA Mars 2020 rover, soon to be renamed tomorrow, actually, if you're watching this Wednesday night um, or Wednesday at any time uh, or very, very early Thursday morning in Europe. Um, <laughs> it's going to be named... Uh, the name's gonna be announced, yep. and it's and it's all sorts of things. Uh, it could be all sorts of things. The, the list of names is tenacity. right beside your face, but yeah. let's definitely read them out. Endurance, tenacity, promise, perseverance, vision, clarity, ingenuity. Am I missing any? Fortitude and courage. Fortitude and courage. Oh boy, those fill me with courage. I don't know. <laughs> I, I love that they were suggested by kids. By yeah, by I do. Various... I do love. I, I do love them all. I love that they are all um, from school-aged kids who submitted these ideas to NASA. The name's going to be narrowed down, or have been narrowed down. It's going to be announced tomorrow. My personal favorite is something like Tenacity, mm -hmm. um, just because it like gives puts me in the mind frame of a, a rugged little rover making its way across a really tough terrain, doing science and not giving up. Yep. So that's that's where I'm going. David, what do you think? Gonna, Place I, your bets. I, I, I kind of like endurance. I mean, that's uh, the so it commemorates the uh, Antarctic mission. You know, the the old HMS endurance. Yeah, so. it has nothing to do with Mars, but I mean, just it sounds like a good solid. But there are a I bunch like, of craters said, named for endurance. endurance already. Yeah, have, have they? I thought there was some feature. There's on craters. Oh, There's a crater, crater called Endurance oh, Crater. Oh, mission. Yeah. I like vengeance too, but I don't think they're gonna call that it. That was yeah, that was my suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Veronica? Do you have a preference? Uh there was something with the vision. Vision, yeah. yeah. Vision. I like that one as well. Yeah, that's pretty good. I feel like that they should pick vision just so that they can get another Avengers tie in like they <laughs> did with that rock. <laughs> and got Robert Downey Jr. to like announce his rock. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, good. I'm going to go with tenacity as well. I think, I think I do, I do concur. And also it'll just be a, easy to write when we're writing articles about this, That's we true. write tenacity. Yeah. Cause you know, with endurance, you're always going to get, you, you're going to misspell it and perseverance. That's true. Too many syllables. Too many syllables. That's just going to take too long to write. So tenacity, make it nice and quick, easy to yeah. spell. We should be all right and with that. Similar to other names uh, that are already on Mars. Yeah. You know, makes a family of names. Yeah. Though I, I will say, really like, <laughs> like you said, similar to other names, like curiosity, spirit, opportunity, those are very like uplifting and sort of <laughs> like true. hopeful sounding. So maybe not tenacity, which implies struggle of some sort. Yeah. I don't know. Promise. Promise might, yeah, with the sample return. Clarity. Because they're, they're setting up for the sam next sample return. So who knows? All right. Well, we placed our bets. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll see what happens tomorrow when we get the when we get the actual name. Good luck to all the name submitters. All right, Dave Dickinson. Yes. Tell me about my bright comet. This is well, it. This is the one, right? There's there's two actually. These are binocular comets, and and there's one that brightened up earlier this year. Uh, y four Atlas was 2019 Y four Atlas that they found right at the end of December. Wasn't really much to it until it brightened about five magnitudes. And the five magnitudes is about 100 times in brightness uh, from magnitude 16 to it's almost binocular. I, I usually say binocular cutoff for a comet is about magnitude 10. So it's magnitude 11 in Ursa Major. It actually passed near the Owl Nebula at the end of February. And there was some pretty interesting photos yeah. that some amateurs did of the comet with the Owl Nebula and one of the Messier galaxies next to it. But this one, I think our best shot is going to be in May. And there's, some, there's something very interesting about this comet. They found out that the orbit of it, uh, Y4 Atlas, is very similar to 
the Great Comet of 1844. Now it's not on the same, it, it looks like it might be a fragment of the same body because it's uh, the orbital period is several thousand years long. So 1844 was uh, 180 years ago. So it's not, it's not the comet of, great comet of 1844, but it may be related to that comet because it's on the same path. And it has a perihelion at 0.3 AU just inside Mercury's orbit. So anytime you have a perihelion that close to the sun for a long period comet, it gets a lot of astronomers' attention. Now they think this one's going to peak at plus third magnitude in May, but one of the problems is going to be is then it's going to be very near the sun toward the end of May. I think our best window to see it up here in Northern Hemisphere is going to be early May when it's rising up through uh, sixth to fourth magnitude, like getting right into naked eye range in the late evening toward the Northwest. So there's another comet, T2 Panstars, that's been being followed for 2020 that's been predicted. It's going to reach eighth magnitude again, good binocular comet. So I don't think we're going to have anything that's a daytime comet or a uh, a bright, you know, naked eye comet out of these, but these are the best we have right now. So it's kind of interesting that Y4, and these are all uh, discovered by uh, survey telescopes right now. I was, I, actually, I was reading an article today talking about we may be reaching the end, of, especially with LSST and all these other telescopes coming online that are going to going to survey the sky like three or four times a yeah. night and generate petabytes of data going down into the 20 magnitude plus we may be reaching the end of amateur comet yeah. discoveries here in a year or two. Unfortunately, that's kind of sad, yeah. but it's uh, right now we're seeing a lot more comets named pan stars and Atlas robots are more comets are getting named after robots than people. Yep. So uh, kind of sad because uh, it's kind of nifty when amateurs discover. It, it is cool. I mean, comet discovery and asteroid discovery is one of the few places left that you can actually go and get something you, you get to, yeah. With comets, you get to have the comet named after you, and with asteroids, you get to give it a name. And yeah. when it comes to planets and really everything else, you don't get to name them. Supernova, it, they just get numbers. And it's strange to think there was a time, like we said, like the Great Comet of 1844, the Great Comet of 1910. So many people saw it when it reached it reached naked eye. Yeah, that it's like that's how comets were found. Uh, the, <laughs> right. the Great Comet, the Great Comet of 1910, was seen by uh, diamond miners getting off their shift in South Africa one morning that they looked up and saw a comet. So it's amazing to think back in the day, you didn't, uh, a lot of comets were, were just, they were discovered when they became naked eye. That's when yeah. people saw them. Yeah. Hale Bopp was the same way. Uh, Alan Hale was, I think he was looking at Messier 8 and he just happened to notice a fuzzy, this is the nineties, noticed a fuzzy patch next to, he wasn't even hunting for comets. <laughs> So it was that, e the bar was that low in a way that you could just happen to be sweeping around and say, hey, there's there's a fuzzy patch that shouldn't be there. Yep. And you've discovered a comet. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not like that anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. Can I have a very beginner question? Yes. Like, how do you know that you discovered the comet? I mean, where is the database? Like, maybe somebody uh, have already the, discovered it. The, the first place usually that's notified is the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams at Harvard for most comet hunters, that's where you send in, what most comet hunters will do, like I said, you're looking and you see a fuzzy patch, you consult your star atlas or your planetarium program and you're like, there's no globular cluster or galaxy or anything in that position that, that's that bright. Most comet hunters, uh, I used to live very near David Levy in Tucson and he has uh, he's found several comets. And he was talking about that generally following it for a few hours, you might see some motion against the starry background. Then that really gets your interest up. That's usually when you send something off to the, they, they call it the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams still, but they don't, they, usually it's by email now. I don't think they've taken a telegram <laughs> since, uh, for many decades. Yeah. But uh, that back in the day, that's how they were notified prior to email is via tel like Western Union Telegram that you would send off and you'd say at this art, right ascension declination, I'm seeing this object and naturally other astronomers that goes to Harvard, then they, they're sending out looking for a confirmation worldwide. But they'll take up to three names, too. You get some comets with some pretty, that's why you get Hale Bop with two names. Two people within 24 hours discovered it. Uh, comet Iris Iraqi Alcock was one that three people found it. Three, two people in a satellite found that one within right. 24 Iris, hours. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, so you, you get these really clunky uh, triple names sometimes. Right. Well, I'm comet. counting on. 2020 2019 y4 to be the <laughs> the the one that finally brings back the the 
naked eye comment yeah, got, that I that I have that I deserve. We got a, we got a naked uh, a very narrow window in May, but I think before right. we lose it in the sun. I like I like those. So you're saying there's a chance. There's a chance. All right, Veronica. Yes. Tell me about uh, why people would lay in bed to learn to fly in space. So yeah, um, to know more about the house in space. That is a short version. Uh, so yeah, I was. Uh, we heard a lot about health on Earth uh, in recent days. So I thought, okay, it would be very interesting to figure out more about the health in space. And of course, I think we all understand that it's crucial for Moon Mars mission to make sure that the astronauts stay healthy and return healthy back to Earth. So we need to understand how the bodies of astronauts change in space and why so since sending people into space is expensive and the researchers came up with several techniques that simulate the space environment on earth so this bad rest technique is one of those so basically how how does it work volunteers um, stay in bed for five to sixty days or more that's amazing I saw like some uh, 360 days, whatever experiments, uh, with their heads down. So oh. usually six degrees below the horizontal. And this better studies basically offer scientists a way to understand how our bodies adapt to the weightless list and um, offer them um, a tool to test uh, the counter countermeasures for the negative effects in space. Because in weightlessness, in weightlessness, I cannot. <laughs> um, so in weightlessness, the bodies lose muscles, for example, or bone density, eyes change, and many other things. So, um, and this bed rest is one of these uh, ways. Another way, terrestrial study, basically is also, um, which was all, uh, recently introduced in uh, ESA, is dry immersion bath. I had to read it. Sorry. Right. Uh, so basically, it is a large bath tube uh, with filled with water. Right. Uh, and with some elastic material on top of it, and the people are getting inside of uh, this bath and kind of floating. So it's like a so water this, bed. It's like a it's water like a bed, but it's covered in kind of like a rubber sheet that you lie rubber on top sheet. of. Exactly. So oh. that you can float on this water, and then you're covered yeah. with some. I don't know, other materials right. to keep you warm. And you lay in this bath for several days. And it's basically this condition mimics the floating astronauts experiments on the uh, European Space Station. And um, so the, the other decided to start the first experiments with uh, all women um, uh, mis uh, mission <laughs> experiments. So they, uh, because there's almost no data on female. Right. Yeah, and this uh, water bath, basically, I, as far as I understood, uh, you can um, uh, stay less than in the normal bath with your head down. So it's like for five days normally, right. the experiment. And, and do you know how similar this is? Like, you know, these bed rest studies that they do, how close is this to what astronauts actually experience? I mean, there's some things that they still can't completely simulate, but does it take them a long way to that point? I cannot answer exactly to this question. When I was researching more on the bad rest, especially about the degrees, so uh, they figure out that from four degrees, you are like feeling effects. And if you go up, like the more you go like with the degrees with your head it makes just you feel worse but it doesn't mimic the space environment as good right, right. so it seems like they figure out the optimal um conditions for uh, simulate simulating it and uh, i don't know how well exactly it yeah is. yeah i mean it's like, I think when people first think about it, it sounds kind of cool. Like, oh, yeah, that, you know, I'd love I, I'd love to be paid to lay in bed. <laughs> and my guess is you wouldn't. 
like no, yeah, there, yeah. There, I, lo- I read some blogs and the people saying that you are getting frustrated very quickly because yeah. you just don't realize how much time we spend on yeah. food uh showering and whatever and just laying in bed yeah in bed it hurts nasa i don't know if they're doing it still they did a similar um bed rest steady uh heather yeah, Ar- yeah for sure yes heather archuleta she blogged about it uh at pillow not on twitter oh she did she do it whole. yes she, oh, is that she how she got it. her name yes that's where pillow not oh. that's where the name comes from and she did part of the the bed rest steady uh, she was there too when they had to evacuate because when there was a hurricane that was heading toward houston uh, they, they, there was. She wrote about that too. They told her that it's like you're going to have to. We're evacuating the center and we're ending the steady now, and you're going to have to figure out how to get up and walk around. Like, oh, <laughs> you better hurry. An hour. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like it's pretty amazing. That is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's kind of amazing how much the human body just really atrophies under this process. And I'm sure within a couple of months. And yeah, I mean, they're constantly drawing blood from you. They're doing muscle biopsies. It is, you know, think about you're having to go to the bathroom. So it's yeah. not fun for science. So just, yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, would you sign up, Veronica? Would you do it? Not sure. <laughs> but you have to dedicate several months of yeah. your time basically to learn that. Of course, you can learn some languages as they propose, like you can study during this time. But uh, I am I I like being active. I, <laughs> I don't know. Five, five days may be OK, yeah. but, uh, but it actually would be very helpful. Yeah. And, and it's actually, by the way, the, the result benefit people on Earth as well, because many of these negative in, uh, effects living in space are shared as people get older on Earth, like naturally. So it's kind of doing this research helps also people that are like lying in bed due to their health conditions, yeah. for example. Fantastic. Kimberly, let's talk about Earth's new moon. Yes, so Earth has a teeny tiny temporary satellite. I've been instructed by yourself and Dave Dickinson, I'm not allowed to call it a mini moon. Yeah. Um, we can debate other terminology at a later point. Yeah, we'll, we'll get on to the, the, we'll the naming there. debate shortly, but let's let's talk about the As news first. As we talk first. about names yeah. of random things. There's yeah. lots of talk about names so far. I yeah, like I know. Um, so uh, sometime a couple weeks ago, a team that was using the Gemini telescope discovered a tiny moving object where they didn't expect a tiny moving object to be. They, as you do, as we've just heard, um, and by tracking the motion of this object over a couple of nights, they were able to figure out that it's actually sort of in orbit around Earth, which was surprising. Um, they have called it 2020 CD4 so far, I guess. Um, and it's a tiny temporary satellite about the size of a car. Uh, and it's either a little itty bitty asteroid chunk of rock, or it's space junk, or something. Can I ask that? Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of space junk out there that it could be. Or and basically, Tesla. or te- it's not the Tesla. Tesla. <laughs> we know that it's not the Tesla. I will say it yeah, is car yeah. sized, but it is not a Tesla. Um, not even a red one. Um, and basically, how this works is that there's all sorts of like little itty bits of stuff floating around the solar system. Some of it is in a very similar orbit to Earth's orbit around the sun. And occasionally, these things coincide with the same position as the Earth and the moon and temporarily sort of get dragged into our space. They hang around for a little bit, and but the the orbits are not stable enough for it to stick around for very long. Um, We actually saw another one of these a couple of years ago um, in 2006. It stuck around for about two years, and then it flew away. It's gone now. Uh, and probably the same thing will happen to this little moon, moonlit. Moonlit? Uh, dwar- yeah. Yeah. We'll get onto it again. Moon, we'll we'll something, have that conversation. Whatever you want to call it. But they, they um, thought it's been here for a couple of years now. Yeah. So the interesting part of it is also that we're sort of catching it on, a, catching it on its way out. Uh, it's not going to be around for very much longer. Uh, and like you said, they thought that it's, it's probably been around for a little bit and we just haven't seen it. We haven't noticed it. Someone wasn't looking in the right spot at the right time. Um, it's a very, very tiny, very, very faint object. It's very easy to miss unless it happens to fall in the uh, image of a very large telescope that you're probably using for something else at the time. Right. Yeah. Um, 
yeah so so there's this tiny little thing we'll study it for a while um we still don't know what exactly it is um and then it'll be gone it feels like the kind of size of object that like remember 10 years ago or so nasa was considering going and grabbing a little tiny asteroid and bringing it back into like lunar orbit or bringing it around asteroid redirect yeah yeah Yeah. the asteroid redirect mission that's like almost the perfect thing it's already just barely captured in earth orbit sort of it it does at the moment it has the wrong momentum it's on its way outwards so it would take a lot more energy to try and drag it back um we'd probably want to catch it on the way in and figure out how to slow it or or something like that or just sort of nudge it in the right way um something like what's going to happen with the dart mission or something yep. um but yeah so it, these things are sort of we think that they're sort of common it's i mean it's exciting that it's here it's yep. going to be only here for a little bit but uh we haven't really been looking for them all that much they're they probably happen all the time yeah <laughs> and we're just not looking for them or we just don't spot them, but it's nothing to worry about. It's not going to yeah. hit us or anything. And crazy. it's not like, don't, don't go there. <laughs> right. But. And, and I know that like, um, on the, the quiz show, is it QI in, in the UK? They have this, they had this question a couple of years ago where they were like, how many moon moons does the earth have? And then their, their official answer was two because actually yeah. there is a second, uh, Cruinia. Yeah is the second object. Oh, Although it's it like a quasi moon. A quasi moon, yeah. but actually has like yeah, a super weird orbit that, that doesn't go in orbit around the earth at all. And, yeah, and, it's it's, and so it doesn't really count. And this doesn't really count either. It doesn't really count either. No. We, we say moon, it's not really a moon. Yeah. Um, in that it's orbital focus is not our, the earth. Yeah. Our, so, our large moon does a pretty good job sweeping our like gold. It does. Gold like keeping these things out yeah yeah Yeah. i mean like we we've we've talked in the past you know mars's moons are captured asteroids neptune has triton which is a captured kuiper belt object but uh, satellite captures naturally just don't happen all that often it's very very hard to capture something permanently um and especially when you have a moon as large as ours relatively speaking um there's a lot of complex gravitational interactions that go into a teeny tiny object trying to make an approach to this to body system of the earth and the moon the gravity doesn't generally work out yeah um all right david uh before we move on give us the official definition of a mini moon because i am seeing mini moon everywhere and yeah, I, everyone need picks to, mini moon yep we need to stop uh, this right now david i know what, i know what is mini, a mini, moon? mini moon is the smallest apparent size smallest full moon of the year the one the moon nearest apogee which is its furthest point from right here. And, and so, who, who first came action. up with that term? Super moon. We did. Yeah, you did. Universe today. Yeah, yes. you did. So, I've seen micro moon bantered around yeah. too. I don't know what's going to stick. That's all right. So a yeah. mini moon is our actual moon just looking kind of tiny. Yeah, yeah the opposite yeah. Of the, op, the opposite of the super moon, which was coined by an astrologer, I might add, actually. <laughs> well, okay. That, that got uh, somehow that gained traction on the internet. So the internet likes to yeah. name things. Blood moon. I, yeah. I like... I like Moonlit, Moonlit or if I'm good. feeling exceptionally yeah. poetic, yeah. ephemeral satellite. Uh, that's yeah. great, too. As it floats away. Yeah, I like that so one, too. If it's too. not the moon, then it's uh, junk. Yeah, space Probably. junk. It's, it's either our junk or the solar system's yeah. junk. One was, of the two. Right. There, there, have, there have been instances. There was an object 2002 that they noticed was a temporary moon. They looked at the spectra, and they saw titanium oxide, and they thought, well, that's kind of weird. They realized it was the paint from it was an old Apollo booster, yeah. And the titanium oxide was the spectra of the paint in it. So they had some of these old space things that are in heliocentric orbit, uh, like Apollo hardware, do come back. They come back occasionally. Yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, Snoopy. Remember, they found that a while ago. One of the old uh, yeah. was it Apollo nine, Apollo ten. Oh. Yeah. The the Snoopy module that was the only one because they didn't land on the moon. They ejected it into solar orbit. They they found it a few years ago. It's still out there. That's incredible. All right, so I'm going to talk just briefly about the bad day that SpaceX had, Elon Musk had, on the 28th of uh, February. And I'll just, I'm going to play the video here so everyone can see it. Here, hold on. Uh, Huge thanks to uh, Boca Chica Gal, who has just got the best view of, uh, and I'll share this with my co-host here so they can see it as well. All right, so you guys should be able to see. All right. Here we go. 
So there goes Starship oh, Mark II. I missed that entirely. Yeah. Oh goodness. I don't think it was supposed to do that, was no, it? No, <laughs> no, that was that was unexpected. I know sometimes they blow up rockets on purpose to like test stuff. I, that wasn't one of them? That was not that was not the plan. So so now um that is the uh So so far Starship has you know, there was the original Starhopper that made its wonderful flight, and we all oohed and odd. And then they started to build the next version of the prototype, the one back in September that Elon Musk stood in front of and said, this thing is going to fly in like a couple of months. And then it exploded. So, so then they built another one. Um, and they tested out their they tested their storage tank to failure, which was intended. And then they're building the Mark II. Uh, which is the one that just exploded uh, a couple of days ago. So now two of them have exploded. And so now they're working on the, the next versions, I guess the Mark III, Mark IV, etc. And at some Did point, it? one of these is going to actually fly to an altitude of about 20 kilometers. And then after that, one of them is going to actually fly. Oh, there we go. Okay, so people are, are, uh, are telling me it's the Mark I, right. So this is Didn't the Mark I. Didn't the prototype the Mark II also have like fall over because of wind? And get like dented. Uh, yes, but that was that before. I'm thinking that of was the right thing. Was, yeah, that's when it was smaller. Okay. They had they had other other mistakes as well. So, um, <laughs> people think it did leave the ground, sort of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it uh, it did um, take flight, and uh, and someone know. made a just a super mean joke that <laughs> they think it's going to get higher than the space launch system. Wah wah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how long does it normally take for them to for another round like well they've got a ton time? of these things under construction already so there's um there's multiple prototypes being under construction some at the boca chica facility and some at the uh at the cape canaveral facility as well so I mean, this was unexpected and unintentional. And as, as Elon Musk said, uh, it, should, it should just buff out on Twitter. He was like, it'll buff out, which I thought was great, right, for him to just, like, totally own up to another one of their starships detonating. Um, uh, yeah, so then hopefully um, they will be able to to get farther with the next one and they they think and i don't understand exactly what this is but that it has something to do with uh the puck there's a puck let's see here they call it the um the puck at the base of the vehicle and so this was a specific weak point and so now they're going to focus in on this and do some additional testing on this exact part and then see what they can do so yeah, but oh, the the point percent. here is spaceflight is difficult, super tough, and and we should be anticipating more of these failures as we move along this journey to get to an actual fully reusable two-stage rocket system. This is a total paradigm shift, and so it shouldn't be a gigantic surprise that they run into a bunch of issues along the way. So... Uh, all of the people who are just anticipating a smooth sailing, you forgot Falcon Heavy. We've seen this before. Kimberly, let's talk about uh, merging white dwarfs. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about one of the best satellites ever. It's the Gaia mission. We love it. Um, and an unexpected find out of Gaia um, is was a white dwarf that doesn't look like a white dwarf should look um this this white dwarf has a, a serial number it's wdj0551 plus 4135 if you want to google that um and basically what what the issue is with this white dwarf um is that it was too massive for what normal white dwarfs look like um most white dwarfs you know which are the the still cooling cores of dead, dead stars, leftover bits. Um, most white dwarfs are about 0.6 solar masses or so. It, and they can only go up to about 1.4 solar masses before they explode in the really super useful type 1a supernova, right. which we use to map the universe. Super useful. Um, 
but having white dwarfs that are about like approaching the upper mass limit is kind of really rare so to see this white dwarf be about 1.14 um or about twice the typical almost mass of a white exactly dwarf exactly twice the almost mass. exactly twice the mass of an average white dwarf that was kind of weird um and to top it all off they followed up these uh, astronomers followed up this uh, Gaia observation with, uh, they got a spectrum, as you do, uh, using the Herschel telescope, and they noticed that the atmosphere of this white dwarf had way too much carbon in it. Now, being being the failed core of a kind of smallish star, the, the white dwarf itself is typically made of mostly carbon and oxygen, because uh, that's where small stars stop fusing. Uh, but then... And then all the hydrogen and helium sort of floats away gently in a planetary nebula. Some of that sort of falls back onto the white dwarf, sort of pollutes it. And you get a little bit of maybe some hydrogen, maybe a little bit of helium, maybe, maybe a tiny itty bitty trace amount of carbon in the atmospheres of white dwarfs. This white dwarf that was twice as massive as it should have been had about twice as much carbon as it should have been, should have had. Huh, that was weird. Mm -hmm. And then the third really weird thing um, is that it was moving uh, through the galaxy a lot faster than it should have been, given what they what the the brightness or the heat of this white dwarf told them it should be. So as as white dwarfs, they just sort of like sit there and they cool slowly, gently as the universe ages. They get fainter and fainter and colder and colder, and eventually they just sort of like sit there as little black chunks of carbon. Um, and so the the brightness, the heat of a white dwarf. Uh, in a neighborhood of other white dwarfs, the the heat temperature uh, or the brightness temperature can tell you how old, how long that white dwarf has been a white dwarf. Um, but this one, there's and there's another way to sort of tell sort of how old an object is based on how it kinematically moves through the galaxy. Because um, as as a star sort of travels through the galaxy and maybe goes up and down above and below the disk of the Milky Way, the Milky Way excites the motion. It, it drags it down faster and it pulls it back up faster. And eventually these things go, uh, older stars go pretty fast as they come zipping through the disk. This pretty heavy, pretty carbon rich white dwarf was moving much faster than uh, its temperature suggested it should. It, it looked younger than it probably was. So here's this twice as, twice as massive, twice as carbony, really, really fast, probably much older white dwarf. And the best explanation for all of these things is that it was actually started out life as two white dwarfs, about average in mass, in carbon, and in kinematics around the galaxy that merged together a little over a billion years ago. Hmm. And so this is not the first ultra massive white dwarf or however we want to yeah. like, Whatever, whatever weird. I like that term. Very ultra massive. Yeah. White Jumbo dwarf. shrimp. Sure. Jumbo <laughs> shrimp is good. Yeah. Jumbo, Jumbo shrimp star. Um, it's not the first one of these we found, and it's not the first white dwarf that we've uh, merged white dwarf that we've found. Uh, it's the first one that we've identified using um, the spectrum, the the atmospheric spectrum of a white dwarf. Uh, and these things are super useful because they're just so rare. It's a whole. It's a. It's a type of white dwarf we don't see very often. Um, and we don't really know how they're supposed to behave when they're almost right at the mass limit of where a white dwarf's allowed to be. Yeah. Um, we don't know exactly how something this massive merges without becoming a supernova. Um, it's a different realm of physics um, that deals with a type of star that's incredibly useful for um, so many different parts of astronomy. Would it ever be possible, Kim, really, for an emerging white dwarf to become a pulsar, like just reach that point and collapse down further? Or that probably goes beyond what I'm <laughs> confident in saying. Well, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna propose I would say that the answer would be no. no because the in between yeah. stage is the Type One A supernova. Oh, okay, and so, so it would, it would if explode you, rather than yeah, so if you've got yeah. them merging and if it's accreting additional material, literally the moment you get to that one point four. It the, says no. Nope. The entire star undergoes carbon burning. Yeah. 100%, essentially. So the entire star just immediately undergoes carbon burning and then it's gone. 
So okay. there would be no way to go beyond that to turn into that neutron star that then becomes a pulsar. So, uh, I mean, this object is, it's, it's rare. It's interesting. Um, it's probably not going to become a supernova ever. Um, but they think maybe what happened is that it used to be just a regular old binary star system um, evolved. Yeah. But you can imagine some situation where maybe it's in, in a trinary system and it's feeding. This is a way to jumpstart a future type 1a supernova where these two are then feeding from some additional star. You know, they, they double up. You get twice the mass right away, and then you sip on the rest of that mass to actually explode. In a hypothetical situation, yeah. I would say yes. In this yeah. particular situation, I don't no. think they've identified any other stellar yeah. companions that are anywhere near enough or old enough to be feeding any sorts of material to this this ultra-massive dwarf. Um, the thing that I like as well... hypothetically, maybe. Yeah, is they found this with the Gaia mission again. Yep. And so, again, Gaia, you know... Gaia, doing good stuff. Yeah, they're able to just Always find all kinds stuff. of things that they want to yep. find with Gaia. So, so go Gaia. Yes. All right, Dave, let's, let's talk about a cool 3D-printed pair of binoculars before we move on. Yes, this is from uh, Robert Asamundi out of uh, Oregon that he just launched his Indiegogo project. Uh, he's had this since Sky and Telescope. We've written about it on Universe Today of a pair of crowdfunded 3D printed binoculars. Now, now not all the parts are 3D, like the mirrors aren't 3D printed. These, these are all uh, sourced. The idea that is it would either ship to you as plans with uh, the parts and you would assemble it or for a higher, there's levels in the Indiegogo project of what you could get for a higher uh, level of buy-in, you would get an actual assembled telescope. Uh, there's two actually, there's the Swift and the Drifter. The Swift is a pair of six inch mirrors. Yeah. And Drifter is a pair of uh, eight inch mirrors. Oh. What they call. Yeah. So it's, I haven't looked through these. No, I haven't either. I, but I've been I talking only... to Robert quite a bit. And, you know, we've been helping him get the word out there. But neither of us have actually had a chance to actually put our eyes. But I mean, I, by far, a pair of binoculars is one of the most enjoyable ways to just observe, to just sort of dive into the night sky and see a big yeah. wide field of view and bring both of your eyes online. So yeah, there, I, there, there have been very few binocular telescopes on the market. Most things have been made by amateurs. I'd like to see somebody bring something that's a general uh, yeah. purpose. Uh, what I like with his, from what I can see in the videos, one big drawback you have with binoculars, is, of course, is the diopter spacing. The spacing of everybody's eyes are a little different. So every viewer, when you're doing public viewing, has to adjust them, the spacing a bit and you have to kind of coach them through that. So it's kind of hard to hand off binoculars from person to person yeah. to do that. But with his, it looks just so intuitive how you can just kind of grab and change the, yeah. the interlock distance on it. Uh, it looked, he says that he's used these at star parties and he's had pretty good results with people looking through them. Yeah. You're looking down through it with the binoculars looking back. Yeah, I can't sense. imagine what you can see with two eight inch telescopes that you're looking at with your two eyes, like yeah. uh, just beautiful. I, I've looked at some other amateur. I knew one person that had a, a binocular chair. He had I've actually, seen the pictures of that amateur thing. had built that swivels and he has like the equivalent of two eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes right here that he can just swivel the yeah. thing around. Like he's he like that. he's the the tail gunner or he's, you know, he's <laughs> in the Millennium Falcon and he's operating yeah. the. Yeah. But nobody's ever really done anything commercially. I think there's very limited that there's been any commercial binocular telescopes out there. So yeah. it'd be interesting to see if this this takes off. So. Yeah, very cool. So do I get it right? So you can <laughs> theoretically print it at home, the parts of it. Yeah. Yes. So he'll sell you either the just the the plans you can 3D print yes. it on your own or a kit that will give many of the parts and then you 3D print the rest. You or, can either source a lot of the parts yeah. or things like the mirrors he's getting. I, there's a company I think he's having fabricate because that's one of the only parts, parts of the system that you can't print, mm. uh, 3D printed mirrors. So yeah. uh, other than that, all the other yeah. hardware for it. They look really futuristic. Too. Yeah. They're kind of... And so they've got an Indiegogo right now. So you can go to uh, Indiegogo analogsky.co and they've actually got a special offer just for Universe Today uh, yes. readers. You can get a $20 discount on the kit, on the plans, for the plans only perk if you do it on Indiegogo. And they're they're not sponsoring us. You know, we're, we're 
you know, nobody's gotten paid for this. We're just that excited about and, about and the, a 3D printed pair of binoculars. The, pro so. the project runs, I believe, till April yeah. 4th, and he's about 50% funded yeah. now. He just yeah. launched Tuesday. Yeah, I, I'm 100% on board to help get the word out. And so, you know, and we got Dave to, to write a story on it. So, all right. Well, Dave, you're on my screen. So why don't you uh, let people know what you're working on and where they can find out more? Yes, I'm still writing for Universe Today, Sky and Telescope, EOS Magazine, whoever else will occasionally have me. And now I'm finally done my, uh, my self-exile from <laughs> writing my book and I can actually come out and engage the world again. You I timed it can... badly though. You could go into your, into your uh, quarantine and, <laughs> yeah, and just now yeah, and, and write. So maybe that you'll do that for the third book. You know, the book is getting printed in China and I don't know if that's going to slow the publication down. Uh, I haven't heard from the publisher yet. It's right. supposed to be out July 21st this summer. So I don't know if shipping or, or yeah. how that's going to affect it. We actually have a semi cover. I think I can show people. Oh, good. Uh, of course it looks backwards probably on this. Uh, but, no, it looks good. Uh, looks good. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh no, it's forwards. I'm seeing it backwards. It's a backyard astronomers field guide to the night sky. Well, they didn't, they didn't put the night sky part on, but, and that's actually, I think that is finally the cover yeah. because that was, and, Hopefully, over the next couple of months, uh, Dave, will you join me to operate the remote telescope and we can yeah, put I'd, this book to the test? Yeah, I'd like to actually. That'd be yeah, cool. that'd be great. Uh, and of course, Astro Guys on all the places. Yes. Kimberly. Yeah, well, I'm going to also do a plug real quick. You should, If you haven't, you should check out Dave's awesome binocular astronomy article on eos.org. Oh, you. He wrote for us all about binocular astronomy. It was awesome. Go check it out. Uh, and you can, let's see, what have I been working on? I've been knee deep in two really big articles about volcanoes and what we're doing to prepare for them here in the U.S. And a really fun article all about planetary lightning. So lightning on other planets, lots and lots of fun. Is there, um, is there lightning on Venus? That's a complicated question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very complicated question, right. and I don't want to anger anyone, so me? Check the article. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah, you'll be able to read about that soon on eos.org. With all my other stuff, or on Twitter, at Astro Kim Cartier. Wonderful. Veronica, where can people find out more? And what are you oh. working on? Yeah. Um, I'm uh, As before, I'm organizing events, and this time I'm prepared better oh, to great. advertise it. <laughs> so, if you are... Uh, in Germany, near Frankfurt in Darmstadt, on 12th of March, you can visit us in cool working space. And we have two speakers uh, from ESOC who are operating spacecraft. And uh, one of our guys who did a uh, like, uh, um, kind of community for new spacers, I would say. So, uh, it, and new spaces in Germany. So it would be very interesting to hear. And as well, very last point, uh, we have also our uh, CubeSat uh, events and meetings, and we are now working together with the university in Darmstadt, who are also building a CubeSat. So if you're interested in doing it, just Google Darmstadt CubeSat. Um, and, and as your event, that's really interesting. Where can I find out more if I'm interested in attending this thing? Of course, you can find more on Twitter or my Facebook, um, Instagram as well, and LinkedIn. I almost everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and what would your account be on these places? Uh, I would rather post it in the uh, notes. So, um, it's so a person different. wants to find you. You said on on March twelfth is, so is your next a, public event and so if people want to find out more where do they go to find out the information find all the okay, details in, in uh, twitter you would find the link my twitter okay. is uh, veronica space perfect great We've got, i think we'll have a link in the show notes so if you want to if you're in, in the uh darmstead area and you want to attend this event on march 12th yeah you can find out more there Nice. All right. Uh, and of course, we just posted a new video on j the Japanese uh, MMX mission, which is going to be bringing a sample back from Phobos, uh, which is pretty cool. So you should check that out on our YouTube channel. And we've got a ton of great space news that's happening on Universe Today. We've, we, 
we built a new system to help the writers uh, organize themselves and they just, I don't know, it's just been like a feeding frenzy now. So I'm seeing a lot more articles on Universe Today and I guess at the end of the month I'm going to have to pay for it. So until then, enjoy. Um, all of you. Nancy news. writing more. Bob yeah, Corberline Nancy's writing, writing a bunch more. more. Yeah. yeah, and I see uh, yeah. um, uh, Brian Coberline's writing some Brian more Cole. stuff as well. And of yeah. course, we've got Evan and we got Matt, plus my stuff, plus all of the videos that we're producing. It's been uh, it's been great. But one thing that if you haven't already, uh, you should sign up to my weekly email newsletter, which I send out every Friday morning. Uh, it contains about 20 stories that I write little stories for each one with pictures plus links to about another 30 things that have happened this week. So it's like the most comprehensive uh, breakdown of everything that's going on in space and astronomy for the entire week. And you can get that from universetoday.com slash newsletter if you haven't already signed up and uh, join the 30,000 other people who get this every week. So, all right, I'm going to put you guys all back up on my screen. There you all are. So uh, thank you, everybody, for watching us this week. Thanks to our special guests. Thanks to the moderators, everybody of the Weekly Space Hangout crew, everyone watching us on Twitch. We haven't forgotten about you. Um, I'm so glad to be here this week as opposed to um, <laughs> the dream vacation with my son. Um, but it is uh, still an honor to, be, to hang out with all of you. And, of course, we couldn't uh, do the show without your continued support. And, of course, you've got me now for forever, really. Uh, so we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.